Okay, folks, this is Dr. Paul. Thank you very much for tuning to our channel this morning. And today I want to talk a few minutes about amyloidosis. You see, amyloidosis, when you hear words like heavy protein area, renal insufficiency, and uh, monoclonal light chains in serum or urine, you should think about this condition. Let's start with the most important points and uh, go one by one. In amyloidosis, basically, there is abnormal protein folding and the normal soluble proteins are deposited in tissues like fibrillage structures and as a result of that deposition they disrupt the normal organic function. So basically this is a disorder of abnormal protein folding in which normally soluble proteins are deposited in tissues as fibrillage structures that, dis that disrupt organ function and produce the disease. So it's, it's due to the accumulation of uh, various insoluble fibrillar proteins between the cells. Uh, between the cells, these proteins, they deposit, they accumulate over the time, and uh, due to the increase of the protein uh, production of uh, certain proteins or accumulation of uh, certain um, uh, protein subsets, they form this beta pleated sheet and the results in high affinity for Congo red. So they have this high affinity for Congo red. Now classification, basically five. Primary, secondary, familial, Alzheimer's, and dialysis related. So five simple things. Primary, secondary, familial, Alzheimer's, and dialysis related. Primary is usually due to monoclonal fast muscle disorder in which the protein that accumulates is a fragment of a light chain of an immunoglobulin. So a light chain of an immunoglobulin produces fragments like a primary disease under primary amyloidosis. In secondary, it's due to a chronic disease or cancer, like a chronic inflammatory diseases due to elevated levels of certain inflammatory cytokines that stimulate liver to produce many of these proteins. And thirdly, familial. Familial is accumulation of mutated forms of certain plasma proteins, particularly transparatin. So mutated forms produce familial. And uh, finally, uh, fourthly, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease can cause amyloidosis. And fib, basically the amyloid is deposited as uh, in the brains of Alzheimer's disease. And fifthly, dialysis related. So those are the five things, folks. And the kidney is the major site of accumulation of these proteins, especially in glomerular membrane and the tubular basement membrane. And uh, so with that accumulation, these patients develop kidney disease. Now, clinical findings. The symptoms and signs of uh, almost any beta cell dyspepsia could be seen in this uh, form. You see, the clinical manifestations of amyloidosis depends on where the protein is being deposited. So, the symptoms and signs could be so varied. So, there are no specific sets. It always depends on where is the accumulation happening. What is the site of amyloid deposition? If it is hot, the patients develop heart failure or some valvular or restrictive cardiomyopathy. Sometimes uh, atrioventricular valve nodal disease or there is a thing called pseudo infarct and low voltage patterns on EKG. If the kidneys are infected, they can have nephrotic syndrome or symptomatic proteinuria. They can develop renal failure. And if the tongue is affected, they can develop a macroglossia. If the stomach, the like gastrointestinal system, uh, is affected, they will develop motility disorders, gastroparesis, and if uh, they develop a peripheral neuropathy, they will develop the stalking and cloud distribution, sensory neuropathies. They can develop motor neuropathies. The accumulation is in the wrist, they can develop carpal tunnel syndrome. And sometimes even autonomic nervous system is affected, resulting in impotence, gastroparesis, orthostatic hypotension, and all those things. And if they affect the skin, it can cause nodules, purpura, and, uh, uh, and also ecchymosis due to the infiltration in the uh, skin. 
And if the amyloid deposits in the kidneys, it can produce polyarthritis or shoulder girdle syndrome. And sometimes they can cause coagulation disorders like factor 9 and factor 10 deficiency, resulting in bleeding. So you see, folks, the symptoms and signs are so varied. And if you see macroglossia, it's almost always pathognomonic of AL amyloidosis. And patients, especially presenting with unexplained proteinuria, and you say, take a patient, and uh, you find uh, proteinuria, they have a little bit of uh, non-ischemic cardiac failure, a little bit of uh, peripheral neuropathy, and a little bit of hepatomegaly, and they are older than 40 years of old, then always, always suspect amyloidosis. When you see those kind of non-specific symptoms presenting together, you should always think about it. Hypertension and hematuria and are said to be uncommon in uh, renal amyloidosis. But in a severe hyper, for example, if a patient comes with severe hypertension and you are seeing proteinuria and they are developing renal failure and uh, they are having hematuria, always keep this amyloidosis as one of the major causes in your differential diagnosis. Now, renal involvement is particularly uh, heralded, like uh, when you see proteinuria, so that's the start, and uh, that's the start of the kidney problem. And these patients, because of the loss of protein, they develop malnutrition, severe edema, volume depletion. And the diagnosis of amyloidosis, AL amyloidosis, can be suspected okay. on the basis of these findings. We take history, physical examination, and you formulate the differential diagnosis. And sometimes you need to take the biopsy. When you see the kidney, like uh, kidney manifested like proteinuria, hematuria, you need to go with uh, a biopsy of the kidney tissue. So the biopsy of an enlarged and uh, kidney uh, should be done. Okay, so those are the things. What about liver? You can do a liver biopsy. And uh, what about uh, other things like sometimes there will be abdominal uh, deposition. That's called abdominal fat pads. Abdominal fat pads you can see using an ultrasound. So in these patients you can do an ultrasound to see any abnormal fat pads happened. Cardiac ultrasound. Sometimes you see uh, any sparkling echogenicity, impaired contractility or relaxation of uh, ventricles. Uh, you can see how the ventricles are contracting on an ultrasound. And uh, as I said, abdominal ultrasound reveals uh, enlarged kidneys. When there is deposition of amyloid happens on kidneys, you can see that uh, uh, on an abdominal ultrasound. When you think, uh, when you suspect renal venous thrombosis, which is common in these patients, you need to do an MRI or a CT scan. So you see, folks, the pathological findings are varied, and then the diagnosis also. I mean, the diagnostic tests you use are also varied because this disease can affect almost any organ in the body. And so is the treatment. And there are a few words that are important that it is Congo red positive and it displays apple gain by refringence when viewed with polarized optics. So it, it, it goes like a Congo red and, and apple green by refringence. Those are the two terms you need to remember. And the proteins are like, uh, they happen like fibrils. They deposit like fibrils and they accumulate over the time and they cause all kinds of uh, havoc. So remember, Congo red stain with polarized optics. Congo red stain, that's, that's a clue to amyloidosis. Whenever you see Congo red positivity, think of amyloidosis. The amyloid deposits, they infiltrate the organs and they disrupt their basic functions. Now let me talk a few minutes about uh, treatment. Treatment of amyloid, AL amyloidosis is generally quite disappointing, folks. That's the tragic truth about it. But the outlook may be improving. I mean, in addition to what can you do for this? Just symptomatic therapy most often. 
just to give some symptomatic relief from those problems. And there are things like viral malfluon and prednisone, but they work only for so-called responders. Only responders respond to viral malfluon and prednisone. And you can repeat them like every six weeks depending on leukocyte counts. And they can slow the progression of the disease. And the survival, the median survival, they can go up to seven years in these patients. Now, long-term survivors of Yale and have shown some objective response to chemotherapy. But ultimately, folks, majority of patients do not respond to malfoulon and prednisone therapy. But the most encouraging results, like the good results are seen with a combination. The combination includes hydrocentravenous malfoulon followed by autologous bone marrow transplantation or peripheral stem cell transplantation. So that is been showing very encouraging results. High dose intravenous malfoulon or then stem cell transplantation or bone marrow transplantation. And stem cell transplantations are very risky folks. They can have some fatal outcomes. In patient come with a multi-system involvement or cardiac disease, they are not good. So, supportive therapy, for example, if patient has a lot of edema, use diuretics. If he has nephrotics and diuretics. If you have hypertension, use diuretics and antihypertensives like angiotensin 2 inhibitors. So, hypertension, use antihypertensives like, anti like angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. If they have pain, use analgesics things like medodrin and uh, there, are, there are also anti-gravity stockings being developed for this patient so give them symptomatic relief from pain and um, uh, also for partial hypertension you can use these gloves anti-gravity stockings and the digoxin and calcium, calcium channel blockers are contraindicated because they worsen the cardiac failure so that's an important point. Digoxin and calcium channel blockers are contraindicated in amyloidosis because there was some cardiac failure. Now, finally, a few words about prognosis. Prognosis is poor, especially if you see patients developing renal manifestations or cardiac manifestations. They have a very poor prognosis. And uh, in patients with uh, renal involvement, the median time from I mean the from from the time you diagnose and the, from the time they develop the ESRD the end stage renal disease just one year. So the survival after dialysis is I mean uh, is not that great either. It's less than one year. So you see this disease is still claiming so many lives either through renal manifestations or cardiac manifestations and most often the, princi the principal cause of death in amyloidosis is cardiac that's an important point the principal cause of death in amyloidosis patients is cardiac so once you diagnose patients with amyloidosis you should always manage you should always uh, first see the manifestations of the heart and also you have to follow them closely whether they are developing cardiac manifestations because cardiac manifestations are the principal cause of death in these patients. That's about amyloidosis. Thank you very much. Hope you got something and visit me at www.drpaul.org. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.